We've been here before. We've done this dance already. This is Samsung's VR headset from 2017, but they had already started their work way back in 2014 with their first release of their VR headset with the Note 4. So what happened? Why did Samsung give up on something they were clearly passionate about? The Gear VR is just one of five products that Samsung has given up on, and today we are going to look at all five. Let's go. Welcome back to Tech With Benefits. Daniel here. Samsung has a history of being too early with technology. They throw everything at the wall and they try and see what will stick. Often much ahead of the time that it actually does end up sticking. And the problem with that is they get impatient. They give up early on categories that end up being adopted by other brands. Last week with the launch of Apple's Vision Pro, like, is our eyesight not pro enough? It got me thinking about the products that Samsung gave up on far too early. Let's kick this off with the Samsung Galaxy Note. The Galaxy Note is Samsung's flagship of flagships. Starting years and years and years ago, the original concept behind the Note was the do-everything phone that would give the absolute best of the best for the consumer in the biggest possible package. The problem with the Note though is that as Samsung kept innovating their S series at the same time, the line started to become blurred with what those two devices offered. That came to a bit of a head when Samsung launched the Galaxy S6 Edge Plus alongside the Note 5. It's a little known fact that Samsung actually had plans for that to be the last Galaxy Note. The Edge Plus launching alongside it was actually a bit of a testing ground to see how consumers would react and if they just wanted a big phone or if they were really loyal to the S Pen that sat inside the bigger device. Well, consumers responded overwhelmingly in favor of retaining the Note. Because the Edge Plus, in my opinion, is the worst S-series device that has ever been made. The reason why the Note stayed was because customers got attached to the pen, the little device that could, that sat inside the bigger picture and allowed and enabled creativity, productivity that you've never been able to get before on another phone. So Samsung kept both lines running parallel to each other. And the last Note that got launched was the Galaxy, you guessed it, Note 20. Now this came out in the same year as the S20 Ultra. The thing was, is that Samsung made the Note 20 Ultra. It didn't really feel ultra considering the numbers it was up against with the S20 Ultra. The S20 Ultra had a 5,000 million power battery. Note 20 Ultra, only 4,500. There was just things that you couldn't really do with this that the S20 Ultra just had more about it. The S20 Ultra had the 100 times space zoom. This only went to 50. I think 50 probably is enough, but you get my point. So there was an impasse. A decision had to be made. Samsung were rapidly developing the fold and the flip line. And there was no way that there was going to be room in the market for the S series with an ultra flagship, the Note series with an ultra line, and then of course a fold and a flip to go with it. So the decision was made in that next year to completely dump the Galaxy Note lineup altogether. The problem was there was a gap they did make the S21 Ultra have S Pen capability, but it didn't quite fit the bill. People were sad. They thought Samsung gave up on the Note line. Fortunately for us, it wasn't the Note experience they were giving up on, just the branding. Rest in peace, Galaxy Note brand name. We still though have the S Ultra, and to be honest, I think that was probably the best decision Samsung made which is probably the only thing I'm going to say about everything that's on this list. Next up on the list, we have the Samsung's gamepad. Now, I have actually done a full video on the gamepad. Feel free to go back and watch that one because I'm not going to go into as much detail on this as I did in that video. The main points I'll hit in this video are that this launched back in 2013. Right at the point when I guess mobile phone games were starting to become really popular. The problem was the devices that were out at the time this launched weren't really 
conducive to extensive mobile phone gaming sessions. People didn't really want controllers at that point. It was ahead of the things like Fortnite and Call of Duty Mobile, which we all know and enjoy today. Samsung seemed to have a bit of a sense that that was what was going to be the future. Playing games on your phone and wanting portability when you take your games around. You only have to look at things like the Nintendo Switch, the Steam Deck, and all the other controllers that also now are made for mobile phones specifically to know that Samsung were on the right path here. I wish they continued with it because this one actually offered quite a bit. It's quite a hefty unit, so you know you've got it. It has a clip to put your phone into. It's a rechargeable battery. You've got NFC for pairing, which just makes it super easy to do so. And the only downfall for it now, if you were to use it now, is that it's got micro USB. Outside of that, it's got insanely clicky buttons. You've got all of the controls that you would want and even triggers at the top right and left corners. So it was a very, very capable unit. It just was too early. And Samsung only made this one unit. They didn't come back for a second, unfortunately. I guess in later down the future, they kind of realized that there still needed to be some sort of compatibility or purpose for mobile phone gaming. They partnered with GLAP, which I actually have a GLAP controller. It stopped working, so I don't even know where it is, but it's somewhere around the house. The GLAP controller was purposely designed and made in partnership with Samsung for the Galaxy Note 10 Plus, which uh, again, that was the last mobile phone gaming that Samsung dipped into. This is the Galaxy View, Samsung's largest ever tablet. Coming in at 18.4 inches. This came out way back in 2015. So not much fanfare at the time, if I'm going to be honest. But I don't think there was no good reason not to be excited about this. Yes, the specs aren't impressive. For a screen this size, it's a full HD LCD screen. So even for back then, it was pretty disappointing, considering a lot of the Samsung screens at the time were Quad HD Super AMOLED. So this didn't really excite the masses when it came out, but it wasn't designed or built for on-the-go mobile consumption. This was a multimedia machine designed for use around the house and pick up and play whichever room that you're in. I can imagine people in rental properties, for example, really loving this use case because if you don't have a TV or your bedroom doesn't have a TV, you can have this in your bedroom, take it around and use it. Let's take a bit of a look at the tablet itself. Turn it around the back. It has a kickstand and a carry handle. So you lock that into place and then you've got yourself a nice little stand for it. And then when you need to, you pick it up and you can take it around with you anywhere you sort of like to go. Shifting around to here, the ports that it has, it has a headphone jack. It has a micro USB cable. Now that's not for charging, funnily enough. That is just so you can, I guess, put movies and shows or content and media onto it so you can watch it on its screen. It charges via this port here, which is actually more akin to a traditional a laptop charger. Strange. It has a 5700 milliamp hour battery, which I find in my usage since I've had this to be more than enough. There's actually another little surprise that it has as well. Flip it down to the back. There is an actual micro SD card slot hidden right underneath here. And you just slide that down to access it. Now, I hear you asking through the comment section before I've even uploaded the video, why didn't Samsung continue with this? They did actually make a second generation, but I just wish that they continued down the path of making the Galaxy View, because I would have loved to see where it went to. With this unit itself, like the software left a lot to be desired. However, Samsung did build specific custom firmware just for this, because obviously Android tablets at the time were not conducive to this type of thing. So down the bottom here, there's this button that actually launches all of your media apps into one place. So if you wanted to jump into YouTube, for example, you have YouTube right there. This was great for its time. A little bit pricey 
at launch. I think in Australia, it launched at $8.99 back then. Now for scale, if you want to talk scale, we can have it side by side next to the Tabas 8 Ultra. Tabas 8 Ultra at 14.6 inches is quite large of itself. But next to this, it's tiny. Now why did it fail? I think there's a number of reasons. I think Samsung were too early. I think they, they had this genius idea for this type of machine, but way too early for consumers to be ready for it. Because you think about it, I can put this on the coffee table and watch football while my wife or the kids are watching something else on TV that I don't want to watch. And this is a large enough screen that I'm not going to miss any of the action. I'm not going to spend any time needing to squint because it is 16 by 9 and 18.4 inches of pure multimedia. So yes, it didn't work out. And I think now had Samsung designed something like this, I think you'd see it to be a lot slimmer. It would have a much bigger battery and you could probably use it as a portable display for your computer or even for your phone. Such a shame. Wait, did I just describe the Tab S8 Ultra? This is the Gear 360. Samsung brought this out way back in 2016 alongside the Galaxy S7. It was Samsung really trying to, to create an alternate mobile phone ecosystem. One that didn't just involve smartwatches or wearables and tablets. They really wanted to create something different and unique. And this was, a, I guess, a little bit of a marker in the sand that they were trying to lay down. Something that was experience led. Something that allowed for something different out of your smartphone. This is the original one. It's quite big. It's a little bit chunky. It's got a little bit of heft to it but it had all of the bells and whistles you would want for a 360 camera from that time. On each side, it has one 15 megapixel camera, totaling for 30 megapixels in resolution when you, would, when you account for both of them stitched together. It has a removable 1,350 milliamp hour battery that is charging via micro USB, which is fine. Obviously, I would have preferred USB-C, but it was before... That was a big thing in the smartphone world. You had a micro SD card slot. You had NFC for pairing. You could run it in photo mode, video mode. You could run it standalone. So if you didn't have your phone with you, all the controls that are on there are set up so you can actually run it without having your phone at all. Especially when you've got the handy little screen and the menu button to cycle through the different things that you might be able to use it for. However, it is best obviously used when paired with a smartphone and we'll go through that in a moment. The hardware was really impressive, especially as you could actually mount this onto a traditional tripod. So you can take that anywhere you like. This did come with a little tripod attached to it. However, I seem to have lost it. But that's the beauty of this is it's actually just a standard tripod mount. So I can go and get any tripod, mount this on and take it anywhere I want. When I was able to use this, I enjoyed using it thoroughly. I would take it everywhere. And I mean everywhere. I used to record myself 10 pin bowling. I took it down to watch Lionel Messi play uh, against Brazil in Melbourne at the MCG and did some recording with it down there. I just really enjoyed everything that it had to offer and where Samsung wanted to take this. So when I th set about doing this video, I wanted to set it back up and see if I could still use it. So I took my S23 Ultra and I tried to pair it using NFC. Unfortunately, Samsung has disabled all of the backend servers that were running the software that I needed to download so I could get this up and running. So what did I do? Did I just give up? No. I went and bought a Galaxy S7. Shout out to Skytree Phones in Service Paradise. Picked this up for 80 Australian dollars. Absolute bargain. And it works great. And it's just, it's crazy to me how light and small we used to have our phones Crazy. So when I realized that it wasn't going to work with my S23 Ultra and I had the S7, I was excited. And then reality struck in because Samsung, as I said, have actually disabled the servers. Because the software on the S7 was updated and all the software that used to run natively that existed on it wasn't there anymore, I had to consult the internet. Thank goodness the internet exists because I was able to find everything I needed after a painfully frustrating 20 minute search. And then I remembered how easy to use this app actually was. All of the stuff that you would want is in there. You can see what photos are housed on the 360 camera itself. You can see what's on the phone and you can 
control things like recording, changing modes, and even live view of the camera. It's a great app, and I'm so surprised that Samsung stopped doing it. So that's a good question. Why did Samsung stop making the Gear 360? Well, it's interesting because they actually made a follow-up, a second generation. Here's, though, where I got really disappointed because they completely nerfed that second gen. They took it down from a 30 megapixel total output to 15. And the size of the unit cut in half, which for me meant that they reduced capability because they were going for form over function. But the second gen, it just didn't have the appeal to me as the first one did. The first one could do so much. It had much higher resolution video recording. You had very intuitive software that, that they could have built on. They killed it off quietly. I know there's some internal protocols that they have when it comes to sales, but honestly, if they had just ignored that and really persisted with this category, they could have created a whole ecosystem that no other smartphone company could have been speaking about as of now. And that's because they also, alongside this, made this to run perfectly and flawlessly with my next one in the lineup, the Gear VR. So last week, I didn't watch it, but obviously when you're on Twitter after a tech announcement, all you can see is Apple's Vision Pro. And the thing that struck me was, I feel like we've been in this position already. I feel like we've had all of the use cases that Apple spoke about that already existed. The Gear VR, when it launched, spoke of being inside a different universe, spoke of the ability to be able to watch movies in a, in a big cinema environment, which I actually remember doing. I sat on an airplane to the US in 2016, watching a movie inside the Gear VR. People didn't know what to make of it. So when that got announced and everyone was talking about that specific use case and how cool that was, I thought we've done this dance. We've been in this position. So then I quickly took to Facebook Marketplace to find one of these. So I picked one up, took it home, and with my Galaxy S7 that I had got as well, I thought I'd check out what the experience used to be like and if I can even still get it working in 2023. The good thing with the unit that I bought, it was effectively brand new. There was absolutely nothing missing from the box. It looked like it hadn't even been touched or tampered with short of opening it maybe one time. So that was great. The unit I got was the one that came out in 2017, compatible with the Galaxy S8, S6, S7, S6, and Note 5. It came with the USB-C, micro USB to USB-C adapter, but of course default was micro USB because that was the majority of the phones that were out at the time. When you take a bit of a look at the hardware, you of course have your home and your back button sitting at the top, and then a very intuitive touchpad sitting just below that. And it kind of just blends into the unit, but that is definitely a touchpad. Along the top, you have a focusing wheel, which is very much forms part of the first experience when you log into this. Looking at the back of it, you have your pads, which are wash machine washable. I think you just take them off by Velcro and then chuck them in the washing machine. And right on the inside there is a proximity sensor. So it knows when it's near your face to activate the screen. So what's it like to use it? Well, in 2023, it's incredibly frustrating because you plug it in and then you're prompted to go and download the software. I downloaded the software. The software took a while to download. You know, it's one of those things that I remember the experience happening the first time it came out where you'd plug it in, it wouldn't download. You have to restart the whole process and then maybe like the third go it would work. So many accounts that it needed to link and set up. By the end of it, I was tired and over it. Eventually, I got it to work. Before I put it back in the unit after everything was set up, I wanted to see the stuff that was available for me to download. But in the Oculus store, it was as if everything that was in there was displaying current content, not stuff that's capable of working on the Gear VR, which was really frustrating. So I just skipped past all that and just wanted to plug it in. Plugging it in is really simple. You just take the cover off, lift this up, pop the phone in, What you need to remember is that this one had two different size settings because Samsung had multiple size phones. I'll get to that later. So you just push that across and then lock it. And then we clip it in. So anyway, you adjust the straps to your liking and then, then you put it on. 
So your interface looks like a bit of a lounge room and you can kind of just sort of look yourself around. And I tried to do a couple of things. There's not a lot you can do in there in 2023. But what I was really surprised by was how good the, the head tracking was. And the resolution of the phone screen actually looked quite nice. I was very taken aback and impressed by what I was seeing, considering this is eight years old. The one thing I was able to really do was find an old Gear 360 photo that I took when I was in Melbourne and I watched it in VR and it's quite cool. It really transported me to being back in that environment. So I think now that I have the VR and the 360 all set up, I'm probably going to try and do some cool stuff, take some cool scenic stuff and see what I can sort of make the two work together. It's kind of exciting going back in time. A little bit. The question is, why did Samsung give up on VR? Here's my opinion as to why it failed. They first brought out a Gear VR in 2014. That VR was big and clunky, but it served a purpose and it worked very good with the Note 4. When the S6 and S6 Edge came out, those phones were too small for the VR that was made with the Note 4. So they made another VR unit. Okay. Then the Galaxy Note 5 and S6 Edge Plus came out and they were too big. Then the S7 Edge came out needed a new VR unit again. Then the S8's turn. There was a point where Samsung would do a launch every six months and almost everyone had a VR attached to it. And also, whilst it was priced competitively in Australia, Samsung were giving them away as a gift with purchase, which meant the value of the product was diminished. You almost saw these on eBay immediately after people picked up their phone and maybe tried it once or twice. Samsung gave up on it ultimately because I feel like they went at it too early. People at that time weren't ready. So what I would say about Apple's Vision Pro is where I think they've mastered what Samsung had failed to do, which was take the concept of VR and AR and actually bring it to life in the vision that Samsung was moving towards. I'm not for one second saying that this can compare to what Apple has currently made, but had Samsung persisted they potentially could have challenged or been Apple's challenger in this space. Because as of right now, what I can see from Apple's Vision Pro, there is no competitor out there. Everything that's currently available doesn't hold a candle to it in terms of the fluidity of the experience and what they're offering. What Apple needs to do is be consistent with its approach. Samsung failed because the Gear VR wasn't consistent. Every new phone launch kept bringing new hardware that would have to go along with it. Apple have started to position this as not a phone accessory, but as a computer in of itself. And I think that's probably their first big achievement is that they are separating it from the already existing ecosystem. It'll be interesting to see what track they continue to develop down with this. I think that does have some merit. However, what they need to do is they need to keep providing use cases that actually make people want to pick it up and put this on. I could watch a YouTube video on here and it would be great. You'd be completely immersed. You could be sensed off from all of the distractions around you, but there's a step that's extra to just picking up your phone and watching the YouTube video. You always will have to put something on your head and until they can reduce that barrier to entry, I don't necessarily think it's going to take over, but we'll see. That could be my famous last words in this space, but what I mean is we've been here before. We've seen it being tried. Samsung couldn't quite make it work. Let's see if Apple can. Well, that's it for this week, everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in and giving me the chance to explore some, some products that Samsung should have kept going with. It's not just hardware that Samsung has given up on. They've also given up on multiple software features as well. And one day I might do a video down memory lane exploring all of the software innovations that Samsung forgot about. But make sure you subscribe and like this video. It's obviously very important for me to build the community that I'm building. It's, uh, it's great to have everyone around. Between now and my next video, make sure you come hang out with me on Twitter and Instagram, and I'll see you next week. You.